Our text for this morning is our first reading from Jeremiah chapter 23. In a few minutes, we'll reread uh, one of the verses of our text together. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the great shepherd of the sheep, dear Christian friends, um, if you remember it, back to our Monday Thursday, when we didn't have a service up here in the church, but instead we, we had a Passover meal down in the basement, it was, a, it was the first time that some people had ever tried roast lamb before. And you know, thanks again to all the guys who actually made that roast lamb, it was, it was pretty good. And a lot of people discovered, hey, this stuff tastes pretty good. But there were a couple of people who will remain nameless, a couple of people who did not want to partake of the roast lamb for the very fact that it was roast lamb. I mean, it's one thing to eat part of a cow or part of a pig. Lambs are so cute, so cuddly. I don't want to eat a lamb, they thought, and I got nothing against them for, for thinking that way. It's understandable to think of what the lamb had to go through. But, but it made me think, how is it then that, that they get lambs and sheep to be processed into meat? Because it's not a natural thing for a sheep to want to just wander up into a dangerous place and have something bad happen to them. They're, they're, they're going to shy away from that. It's really interesting what, what, what happens, what sheep producers do in, in order to get the sheep to enter the trucks or enter the slaughterhouse itself. They introduce a new animal into the flock. It's usually a goat. And they don't do it immediately before it's time for slaughtering. They introduce the goat into the flock several weeks beforehand so that the goat gets to know the sheep and more importantly, the sheep get to know the goat. The sheep develop a level of comfort with the goat. They trust the goat. And then when it's time, the goat's been trained. The goat walks them all up the ramp, and the goat knows to walk out a secret entrance on the right that the sheep don't know about. There's actually a term for this goat. It's a real agricultural term. It, he's the Judas goat. He betrays the sheep. As human beings who very rightfully have been called by our good shepherd, sheep. Can't we think of Judas goats in human history? People who have led large numbers of people astray to their deaths through clever speech, telling people what they want to hear. Yeah, yeah Hitler was a Judas goat. Stalin was a Judas goat. Mao was a Judas goat. Millions of people died because they followed what these people were saying. It reminds us of who we are as human beings. We don't always like to think so, but we are sheep. And sheep can be led astray. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Romans, quoted Psalm 44, where the psalm writer said, Yet for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And yes, like we told the kids, all of these Judas goats ultimately operate under the auspices of that one great deceiver, the lion who wants to destroy us all, Satan, but we don't always recognize them when they come. Thankfully, there is a leader who stands above every other human leader. There is a leader that they all answer to, and this is a leader that, that can be trusted. This is a leader who works for our good. Even though we as sheep are looked at by this world as people who can be taken advantage of, people who can be used and abused. And after the politician has got our vote, after the salesman has closed the deal, they don't have need to have anything to do with us anymore. There is a leader who actually does care for us. This isn't the only text that tells us this truth, but it's highlighted here in Jeremiah 23. Christ is the real shepherd. 
If you would, please reread with me verse 5 of our text chapter, uh, from Jeremiah 23. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Well, by the time Jeremiah wrote this, King David had been dead for about 350 years. David was dead. So why mention David here? Well, well, when you think of kings of Judah, David was the best. In fact, you can make an argument that when King David ruled over Judah and Israel combined, that nation was the strongest nation on earth. No wonder then, when God's people thought about the good times in days gone by and longed for them to come back, they would refer to the time of David. And God referenced that then in talking about the Savior that he would one day send. Say that he would raise him up to David. Of course, that was more than just a metaphorical reference. The Savior to come would actually be a physical descendant of David. And scripture makes a very big point of pointing out how both on Joseph's side, according to the way that genealogy was reckoned, and on Mary's side, where Jesus' biology actually was reckoned, Jesus was a descendant of David. There were other descendants of David, though, too. We'll talk about a couple of them in a minute. David, though, didn't always look like he was going to be a king. When Samuel the prophet was sent to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king, he looked them all over. After seeing a couple that really stood out, he asked, do you have any others? And Jesse said, well, yeah, there's the youngest. He's out tending the sheep. That's who David was. David was a shepherd. While you might think of a shepherd as someone to be looked down on, though, David was a very good shepherd. David cared for his flock to the extent that he risked his life and fought and killed wild animals to protect his sheep. So, in that way, David is a picture of his descendant, Jesus. Because Jesus is both, at the same time, a king and also a shepherd. That's also, though, what God meant for the kings of Judah to be. Kings and shepherds as well. When we think of the context into which our text fits, Jeremiah chapter 22, right before our text, has Jeremiah preaching against three kings of Judah. First of all, Jehoahaz, and then Jehoiakim and Jehoiakin. Jehoahaz ruled only a few months, and then the Egyptians invaded, and they hauled Jehoahaz off to Egypt as a prisoner. Jehoiakim ruled a little bit longer until the Babylonians got tired of him and had him killed and installed Jehoiakim in his place. But Jehoiakim displeased the Babylonians and they hauled him off into captivity in Babylon. And all these things are prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 22. And then you get to chapter 23, and it's really just a continuation of what Jeremiah has been talking about. He speaks to these three kings, and he says, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. They were kings, and they were, they were very concerned about being kings, and they, they negotiated treaties, and they made sure their palaces looked nice but they were supposed to be shepherds as well. They were supposed to take care of the spiritual needs of the people, and they couldn't care less about the people. They were Judas goats. So God says, woe to these shepherds who are driving my sheep away because my sheep can't find any care. This is probably a pretty obvious application to our day and age, and we had briefly referenced it earlier. When an elected official takes an oath of office but then works not for the good of the people that he or she is serving but for their own personal good, what are they? Well, ultimately they're Judas goats, aren't they? They said they were going to do one thing but they do another. And in our memory, we can probably think of several people who would fit this description. Judas goats. 
They say one thing, they do another. They have no real concern for their constituents. In fact, they see their constituents as a means to an end. Truth be told, any leader who does not confess Jesus Christ as Lord is going to be a Judas goat. And God pronounces the same thing upon them that he pronounced upon those kings of Judah. Woe to them. Woe to them. It isn't going to be a pleasant time on the day of judgment for leaders who have led unfaithfully. In contrast, God says, because the you human leaders have not done what you were supposed to do, because you've ruled selfishly, with your own interests in mind, instead of the interests of the people who, that you were ser who were serving under you, I'm going to give you a real leader. A righteous branch from da will be raised up to David. And the very fact that Jesus was this righteous branch is something Jesus himself attested to when he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All human leaders serve under Jesus whether they recognize it or not. And Jesus will call all leaders to account someday. And it isn't going to be pretty, say, for the five members of the Supreme Court who have done an abominable thing in our country. Just as a for instance. Jesus, on the other hand, is described in our text in a wonderful way. He's righteous. He always does what's right. The word right is right there in righteous. And while this might be a word that we can pass by really quickly when we see it in the Old Testament, it's filled with meaning. And our text helps bring that out. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord, our righteousness. Jesus always did what is right, and then, knowing that you and I live underneath a perfect God who calls us to be righteous and always do what's right, but we don't always do what's right, Jesus says, here, take my righteousness as your very own. Through faith, take my righteousness. Believe that I am who God says I am, my Father in heaven. Believe that I have died to save you, and you have my righteousness. God will look at you as if you are perfect. As king, he reigns wisely. We've talked about this before, too. How it can seem at certain times in life or in current events that things are spiraling out of control, but they're never out of his control. And sometimes things spiral out of control just so that we can have to admit that we don't have control and we need him to be in control. Whatever is happening to us, good or bad, happens to us only with his permission and only because he wants to bless us in some way. And even as he reigns wisely, he also provides safety. Here is the shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Here is the one who, as we told the kids, closed up the mouth of the roaring lion. Here is the one who, instead of coming to you to see what you can give to him, comes to you and wants to first talk about what he can give to you. Christ is the true shepherd. But did you notice in our text, it never said that God was going to send a shepherd? Said He said, through Jeremiah, I will send shepherds. Christ is the one true shepherd. But God said he would send shepherds. And Jeremiah was one of those shepherds. Unfortunately, Jeremiah ran into trouble with another one who had been called to be God's shepherd. And the temple official Pasher had Jeremiah put in chains. He was supposed to be a pastor, in a sense. He was supposed to be taking care of Jeremiah's soul and the souls of the people. Instead, he had Jeremiah locked up. Even after Jeremiah was released from that, the same guy had Jeremiah thrown down into a cistern. That's not very loving. 
There is a reason why we call our Lutheran clergy pastors. The word pastor means shepherd. And God has always entrusted the ministry, the direct ministry of human beings to other human beings. He has called shepherds. And Jeremiah, even while he was in chains, in stocks, even while he was stuck at the bottom of a cistern, he was still being a pastor. He was still proclaiming God's word to those who would hear. His very life was a message that God was sending to the people of Judah. Repent. Destruction is coming. Faithful shepherds will always be heard by those who are truly Jesus' sheep. Which leads me to ask you, longtime members of St. John's, a question. I think I've been here long enough to ask you. What do you guys miss most about Pastor Kratz? It's not that you have to tell me, but, and please understand too, I'm not asking it out of some sense of insecurity. I just want to honor the man for 30 years of service here at this church. And I know that many of you personally benefited from his ministrations. He's a different man than I am. Different strengths, different weaknesses, different skill sets. I understand that. It's never my goal to make any of you forget him. At the same time, too, I wonder if Pastor Kratz ever wandered around in the Welcome Center and came upon that... that, that wall hanging we have with all of St. John's pastors and thought, are you kidding me? I'm serving at the church where John Brenner was listed as pastor? That, that's a pretty impressive name in Wells Circles. Or we could go back even farther. We call ourselves Lutherans, right? So let's go back to one of the most prolific pastors, a, 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 preachers, sermon writers, a, and commentarians there were. Martin Luther himself, he was a very good pastor. And God raised each of these guys up in a specific time for a specific group of people to do specific work. And yet, they and every true shepherd understands that they are just under shepherds, really. Whatever good work Pastor Kratz did among you was really Jesus working through him for you. Whatever good work any pastor does among you is really just Jesus working through that pastor. And so we have different pastors, different ways of preaching a sermon, I suppose, Guys we perhaps enjoy more than other guys and even get along with more so than others. But there is only one true shepherd. That joins us together as Christians. With Christians of the past who are served by other pastors. That joins us together with other Christians in other congregations served by other pastors. We are united under that one shepherd. The real shepherd. The true shepherd Jesus who is, at the same time he is a shepherd, also a king. Praise be to this shepherd king for doing so much good through his under-shepherds for us, his flock. If there are Judas goats that come into our midst, may God give us the strength to recognize them, steer clear of them, and may we all look forward to the time when we will be grazing in the eternal fields of heaven, living peacefully and joyfully with all of Jesus' sheep under the one true shepherd. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.